Dr. Yoni Witten here, and this week we're talking all about feet. Now, foot problems are a big deal in modern society. By some estimates, as much as one-third of our population is suffering with chronic foot pain. This week, I got to sit down with functional podiatrist and foot expert Dr. Emily Splickle to talk about a host of different foot problems, what's causing them, and more importantly, what can we do about it. Let's get into this. Welcome everyone. I'm super excited about my guest today. Dr. Emily Splickle is a functional podiatrist and an expert in all things related to the foot. Welcome Dr. Splickle. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy that you're here because your take on podiatry seems to be very different from the conventional model that's out there. And before we get into those differences, I'd like you to talk just a little bit about your background and what made you get into this profession. Yeah, so I am a functional podiatrist. I've been licensed for about 10 years and I got into podiatry really through the direction of movement. Um, I was in the fitness industry or I've been in the fitness industry for over 20 years. And before that, I was a competitive gymnast. So movement and being active was always really important to me. Um, as we go into my history a little bit and my approach to barefoot science and strengthening the feet, Ironically, I was a barefoot athlete. I don't think I connected that in that initially, but had an appreciation for movement, the power of the body. I'm fascinated with movement. Um, and then when I started looking at medical specialties, podiatry kind of was one of those opportunities. And then within podiatry, I really think my background in movement and fitness laid this undertone to explore and to question things. So for me, to just look at the foot in isolation doesn't sit well with me. I knew that there was much more to the body and that how the foot definitely was influencing things higher up. And then that really opened up unique opportunities for me to carve a niche within the medical profession and within the podiatry community. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm a huge advocate to really challenge the podiatry community and how the profession looks at feet right now. That's that's absolutely fascinating. And that's what really made me want to want to get you on so that I could talk to you is because I was I, I gravitated so much to your videos because of your unique approach. So is functional podiatry then your creation? Yes, yeah, so you could kind of say that I'm sure there's other people who use that word functional podiatry because functional medicine is actually more and more popular now. I'm sure a lot of the listeners may have heard of a functional medicine doctor and functional medicine doctors look holistically at the entire body, looking at your sleep patterns, inflammation levels, gut biome, um, everything, stress patterns, autonomic nervous system. So it's very holistic. Mm -hmm. I bring those same principles into podiatry, meaning I look at those exact same things. I look at sleep patterns in my patients, um, diet, their gut biome, everything. And then I extend it even further to look at functional movement. So I look at every single one of my patients walking. I look at them go upstairs, downstairs, squatting patterns, um, T-spine range of motion. So really whole body functional movement plus functional medicine added into that. That's absolutely fascinating. And, and I'm, I'm assuming you did not get that from your time in uh, podiatry school. Absolutely not. <laughs> so, uh, I actually had to go back. I was doing my residency, my, my surgical residency, and I actually paused that and took a break, went back to graduate school, and I got a master's in human movement. And after I got the master's in human movement, that then connected feet and movement in the way that I needed and I knew that existed. And then I went back, finished my surgical training so I could get licensed, and I did surgery for five years. So I was an active uh, foot surgeon for five years, and then eventually pulled away from that to really foster my passion and curiosity for functional movement, functional medicine, regenerative medicine. So a big part of my practice is actually regenerative medicine as well. So I do a lot of PRP and growth factor stem cell, stem cell injections as well. Um, and then other 
uh, applications was um, I'm going through my fellowship in the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. So that kind of ties into things as well. And then took alternative trainings and workshops as far as focused pelvic floor work, breath work, mm-hmm. fascial work, things like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I know that you uh, you mentioned Dr. Yanda quite quite uh, frequently in your videos, and I, I'm a fan of his work as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference then between what you do, which is a lot of the things that you just mentioned, and then what people get when they come out of podiatry school? Like a lot of us that are on the outside looking in associate podiatry with either a uh, very expensive orthotics or surgery on the feet. So uh, can you speak to that from a, an educated standpoint? Yes. So those are probably the two biggest recommendations that what a traditional podiatrist is taught about or taught in podiatry school is really foot in isolation. We do learn about gait and gait assessment, but it's not emphasized because the way that the education and the training has changed, it's become very surgically driven. So they want to actually, uh, not breed, but (laughs) shape and teach the future of this surgical space that is sitting next to orthopedic surgeons. So a lot of people think of orthopedists they may be think of than orthopedic surgeons. Podiatry as a profession is really pushing that same thing is that when people think about podiatrists, podiatric medicine, orthopedic medicine, they're thinking the surgical intervention or the surgical skill set that we offer. Um, so the training, the residency training, which is now three years. So once you graduate medical school, you go through three years of surgical training and there's actually four year programs as well to do really in-depth surgery of the foot, which means a lot of the other really important functions of the foot and what a podiatrist can offer a patient unfortunately goes on the backside because surgery is a skill. Like it is, you need to keep your hands wet and you have to be in the OR to keep that skill. which means the talent behind orthotics actually gets compromised. So the orthotics that are put out by some of the podiatrists is kind of generic or templated because of um, their focus more on surgery or on sports medicine, functional movement, gait assessment, complex gait assessment, movement disorders, chronic pain, the nervous system. A lot of those things then just become a little bit lower priority next to the surgical skill. Um, So that's just part of it. Um, And that's why I had to really pause, take a step back from my training, focus on the other aspect, and then make the decision to step away from the OR. And it's a a hard decision to make. Um, I made that decision in 2000. 17 about so about 2017 is the last time I was in the OR and it was really hard I was like I don't know if I can do like I'm closing a a door I'm break uh kind of breaking that bridge in a sense that I really wouldn't ever be able to go back um and do surgery which is it's a hard decision but now being able to offer patients a full functional assessment a really detailed in-depth gait assessment and then offering regenerative medicine and corrective exercise um i am now like oh man i should have done that years ago (laughs) let's put down the scalpel (laughs) that's that's absolutely fascinating i i do have a question from a philosophical standpoint though so if the main things that are being pushed are orthotics and, uh, and surgery and, and podiatric medicine is heading the route of making all podiatrists into extremely skilled surgeons, what is the overarching philosophy behind all of this? So I, I did a little bit of, of digging in, in preparation for our conversation and, and, and what seems to be out there in the literature is somewhere between 13% and 36% of people in modern society suffer with foot pain, aches, and stiffness. So it's a pretty broad range, but you're talking about a large percentage of the population. So what is the overarching philosophy in podiatry school of why so many many people have these foot problems? Is it because from birth we're dysfunctional and we all need a properly fitted orthotic, or is, is there some other reasoning behind it? 
Yeah, so I think that a, the profession is to some degree taught that it is because of um, irregular surfaces, that we weren't designed to be walking on concrete and the urban changes of our day-to-day -day activities have changed. So now the foot has changed and we need to support that change in surf and surface and movement patterns through things like orthotics and structured supportive shoes because the foot needs that artificial art support to be on artificial surfaces. I don't fully believe this, of course, because that's not really true. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, are there certain people that benefit from structured shoes and orthotics? Yes, sure. a majority of us do benefit by still connecting to the natural foot function, to get sensory stimulation to your feet, to strengthen your feet, to intentionally do foot exercises. That is part of what's missing. And I know that you probably appreciate this as it relates to the core and low back pain and things like that, is that you, you hit a point where you can't just continue to do what you're doing and not strengthen the supporting structures and just kind of rely on, I don't know, genetics or, or right kind of good natural strength, that there has to be a focused intent behind strengthening the core, strengthening the lower back, strengthening the feet, strengthening the rotator cuff. So these smaller muscles that we often take take for granted that get stressed through repetitive day-to-day -day movements and standing and walking are repetitive day-to-day -day movements that require the same reset and strengthening that any other part of our body does. Mm -hmm. Yes, well said. So you mentioned uh, tucked into uh, your explanation there that you don't believe what's being taught there in, mm -hmm. in podiatry school. Can you expand on that a little bit as far as uh, the origins of foot problems in modern society. I personally believe that a lot of the foot problems in modern society is because of modern footwear. And the reason why I take that approach is because I look at the foot from a sensory perspective, not a biomechanical perspective. And what we're actually taught in podiatry school is foot function from a biomechanical perspective. That means, you know, supination, pronation, high arches, low arches, flexion of the ankle, right? So it's, it's very mechanical based. And the human body is not just a bag of bones that is like a robot of joints moving, right? It is to some degree, but then you have this fascinatingly complex nervous system or computer that is running that robot in a sense and what influences and shapes and kind of defies the the movements of our body is sensory stimulation sensory processing the perception of ourself our breath do we connect to our breath what's our stress level how are we sleeping are we in fight or flight do we feel the texture under our feet so it's all very sensory driven and I feel that shoes, modern shoes, cushioned shoes, disconnects us from the sensory perception of our feet and the ground. And if you think of a baby learning to stand and to walk and just really connect to their body and space, it's all based around feeling feeling themselves and feeling the external environment. And a lot of that's based off of the ground right? So connecting to the ground. So as they start to feel like, okay, when I feel the ground, I feel safe. This is my base, right? My feet are on the ground. I feel safe. Okay. Now I can start to lift my body up and stand. Okay. And as I'm learning to stand, they connect that foot stimulation to really posture, gravity, safety, and then movement. And we lose that in shoes. And that's really I don't know, my mission <laughs> to help the, the future generations reconnect to that again. That's an awesome explanation. I, I, I love the sensory based. And uh, can I ask where you got that from in your education? Um, so when I was getting my master's in human movement, I was studying barefoot science. So this was in 2009, approximately 2008, nine, when the barefoot running boom happened, right? So I'm sure people remember going to run the book and then the Vibram five finger shoes and all of that. 
it was right around that period. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing a lot of people speaking about foot function and barefoot that didn't necessarily have the qualifications of understanding the foot. So I was like, oh, well, this is very interesting because of being a podiatrist, understanding movement. And then I, I was going through my master's. So all you do is read research. So I just read every research article around feet, barefoot, sensory, nervous system. And then I essentially just kind of evolved from there. And then I just kept asking why, why, why? And it just kind of kept leading to massive tangents of exploration and ways that I can connect it back. Um, and even I was on a call with Baylor College and one of the researchers yesterday, and an example of how this has now evolved even more is looking at sensory stimulation of the feet using texture. So this is a, a Naboso research study that we're looking to do with Baylor College and how textured stimulation of the feet can actually reduce blood viscosity and increase circulation to the foot. Mm -hmm. And we, we see this anecdotally that people who are barefoot and not in shoes have better circulation. People who wear the Naboso insoles actually have better circulation of the feet. This is subjective perceived circulation of the feet. So we actually want to do a research study. So that's another connection. That's another connection of where you can take this and say, oh, to bring in sensory stimulation of the feet and to be barefoot, that actually helps people with circulation issues, with neuropathy, with diabetes, with ulcer prevention. Um, so it's, it's huge. But yeah. you have to just keep asking yourself why is what you have to be curious. Maybe that's what it is. For sure. Um, so you mentioned Naboso there and um, uh, an insole that sounds like creates some kind of sensory stimulation. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Oh, okay. So yeah, so I launched Naboso, which is a product line of insoles, mats, flooring, release tools, and we have socks that are coming out in a month. And they all have texture on them so the skin in the bottom of the feet like the skin on the palm of our hands has very unique nerves and these nerves are sensitive to different stimulation texture is one which i'll speak about in a moment um pressure vibration is another one skin stretch so very specific stimulation that we actually experience every time your foot strikes the ground so your foot's on the ground or you're walking on various terrain the nerves in the feet need to be able to sense that, to feel it, right? To feel the irregular edges or to feel the vibration of impact forces. So impact forces is actually vibration. And that's sensed by these nerves in your feet. So part of my master's was really looking at these nerves and studying them and seeing, okay, how do we bring in vibration? Okay, take cushion out of your shoes. If you have cushion in your shoes, the cushion absorbs the vibration, but we need vibration to tell your brain how hard the surface is, how hard you're striking the ground, the acceleration rates to maintain balance. So it's, it's shaping everything, right? Texture is another one of those. And there's a lot of textured insole research that's out but there was nothing that was commercially available. So this is an example of one of the insoles. You can see the texture on top of it. So that texture is stimulating the nerves in the feet. And we have other products that are stimulating the hands. This is one for hands um, to activate the brain to shape movement. Because again, at the end of the day, that's what I treat as movement. I don't treat feet, I treat movement. Yeah. So if I can help people connect to the feet and the nervous system in today's reality, which might be cushioned shoes. So if you have cushioned shoes because you need it because you have fat pad atrophy on your foot, mm -hmm. well, let me bring texture into your shoe to at least offset some of that disconnect that you're getting from footwear. Mm -hmm. So what you're just talking about is, is different ways to drive up sensory stimulation to better guide movement. 100%. That's an awesome approach. 
because it's it's literally directly in line with with what we do in the clinic. And and the classic example here, if we go to the far end of the spectrum, which I'm sure you're aware of, is phantom limb pain, mm -hmm. where you've actually severed the limb and there's zero sensory input. And then a lot of these people develop this horrendous pain because of the complete lack of input, but the brain still has the mapping. So basically it's just a blank spot on the map. And, and there's this fascinating research that I'm sure you're aware of because you're nodding your head so enthusiastically <laughs> about stimulating the brain that's responsible for controlling the severed limb and that eliminating pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, what you're talking about is just further down the same spectrum of somebody who still has probably all of their limbs and and you're just ramping up stimulation yeah and to me like phantom limb pain uh reflex sympathetic disorder or uh complex regional pain syndrome mm -hmm. right yeah um so various nervous system peripheral nervous system conditions are very fascinating to me especially those that have uh, an autonomic influence or like you're saying phantom limb because of how it demonstrates the complexity of brain to limb um so yeah and it's there's so much um new research that's out there on how to modify that and regulate that and a lot of those conditions unfortunately don't take a high priority for certain medical specialties because it's um it's more of a quality of life issue. And that's the other thing that I really specialize within my practice and through Naboso and just everything that I do is really based off of quality of life. And if someone has chronic pain or a chronic movement disorder or a chronic movement dysfunction, they're not medical emergencies, but they're still really, really important to that person. And a lot of, not all, but a lot of my frustrations in the Western medicine, traditional medical community of why I've diverted into the way that I see patients is because they can't offer a lot for those patients. And to just say like, I don't know, or live with it, or like, that's just the last thing that a patient wants to hear, mm -hmm. right? Because it's still like their day, every day, day in, day out, they're living with this balance issue. Mm -hmm. or something like that yeah. um and that that's a big part of what we do at nabo so is helping people feel their feet changes so many people's lives and it's it's really powerful that's awesome that's awesome and and i i relate uh, very much with uh, at the pain fix protocol uh, you know everybody who's a member of the program or who's who's part of the community they've been to doctors they've been to lots of doctors most of them and because they don't fit neatly into any of these categories they usually get thrown prescriptions and shoved off into a dark corner somewhere because as you hit the nail right on the head it's not a medical emergency so they're like eh, it'll go away on its own or come back and see us when i always say this come back and see us when you have a real problem meaning a life-threatening emergency which is what conventional medicine is awesome at dealing with. I tell my patients all the time, if I get hit by a bus, there's nowhere I would rather be. Yeah. But if I've got a bunion starting to form, I think I would rather talk to you. <laughs> so speaking of that, um, the other thing that I, that I found when I was uh, preparing uh, for our conversation is uh, the increased incidence of foot pain within certain populations. And I'd like you to touch on this, if you would. Um, so there's three populations that that popped up over and over again in, in, in the literature. The first was um, obese people, which I think it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to say like, hey, if you take a vehicle and you load it up with as much heavy stuff as you possibly can and then put weight on the roof rack and then have people hanging off the front and back and you're putting more load on the structures than they were ever intended to handle that they would wear out in a faster way the same way a suspension system on a vehicle would if you did that to it um the second thing is people over the age of 50 and this is in my mind uh two things it's a wear and tear issue just from cumulative uh, i saw something that we take uh something like 216 million steps over the course of our lifetime for somebody who's moderately active but the second part of that besides the number of steps is if somebody has a slight deviation or a compensatory pattern then that gets amplified and it gets amplified 
on every step that you take. And so by the time they get five decades into life, those problems are going to start to manifest. And then the third group, and this is the one that I'm particularly curious about, and I would love to hear your take on it, is women. And every study that I looked at consistently showed that women have way more foot problems than men do. And I would love to hear your opinion on that because, um, because I'm very curious and because I'd love to have a woman's take on it. <laughs> so yes, I'm familiar with all of the, the statistics or trending statistics that, uh, you know, obesity and then aging population and women as far as foot pain. And yes, agree with what you're saying as far as obesity and then the load on the system. There are some studies that were done on the plantar fascia and how much obesity increases the baseline tensile um, just tension on it, like the pole that yeah. is sitting on the plantar fascia, just statically standing there. And then you start moving and then that's going to just stress it even more. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but there are some research studies that show that. And it's for every, you know, X number of pounds or percent, you know, body weight increase that you can see that. Mm -hmm. um, I also just, um, you know, from my own experience of seeing patients that there is a strong correlation between uh, obesity and foot pain, specifically plantar fasciitis, um, because of increased weight bearing and then what that can do to all the ligaments that keep the foot and the, the shape of the foot just starts to get stressed and then that translates into the plantar fascia. So typically there are plantar fasciitis studies that you will see around uh, obesity. That's kind of the, the hot foot diagnosis. And I'm sure that there's some research showing that the prevalence of obesity is increasing and even childhood obesity, that that's increasing as well. So that's a big one that we can hit. With the one um, over age 50, is that is one of the fastest growing uh, populations. Is, is It's actually 65. So 65 and over is one of the fastest growing demographics within the really world population. It's one of the fastest growing. So if a lot of people are older or professionals such as you, we will see more and more of the older patient having certain conditions because of that population increasing. And that is a wear and tear issue. Um, and then let me talk about the women that will make that comment. And then with the female is that the easy answer is that it would have to do with footwear. <laughs> and the, the shoes that women wear and the, the prevalence of wanting to be in maybe stilettos or narrow shoes, things like that. What I will say is I've advised many footwear companies. I will not disclose the ones that will say this, but they always make women's shoes narrower or tapered. So the shape of a women's shoe, even from a minimal shoe company, that is some minimal shoe companies are gender, gender neutral. And they'll say, okay, this shoe is for this or men's and it's, it's gender neutral. The ones that are actually breaking them up is this is a female shoe. This is a male shoe. The female shoes almost always are more narrow and they taper. So it's like the aesthetics of a car. So it's plain with the eyes that the women's foot will be narrower. So it's just simply aesthetics. Um, the women's shoes are historically a little bit more narrow. It's Doesn't a corset mean, for the feet. <laughs> We're still putting women in corsets. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but then the, the last one that I did want to just add a little bit that there is some research around it is hormone changes. So okay. if you're, if you're looking at hormone levels in obese populations is there is a lot of dysregulated hormones, specifically the estrogens, where a lot of estrogens are actually found in a lot of foods. Now, this is very sad. This is where you can actually have young girls going through puberty earlier because of hormones in food. Hormones are very dysregulating to connective tissue. So if you have, if you're overweight, you're over um, 50 or you're postmenopausal and you're female, so you have kind of like three strikes. This is where you'll actually see probably the highest prevalence of foot pain would be an obese female who's postmenopausal. And that's where you're getting all three of those. And a lot of that actually has to do with the hormone changes mm -hmm. of, of what is happening. Um, so hormone changes on connective tissue and fascia 
tissue is something that I try to focus on with my aging female population. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one other thing that's not mentioned in the research, and you and I chatted about this before we started the conversation today, is uh, disuse, which we're seeing a lot of in modern society. You mentioned obesity rates increasing significantly over, say, the past 30 years. Um, and disuse is a big part of that modern society. We've kind of um, softened everything. We've added cushions to everything. You mentioned, mentioned cushion shoes, but we sit in cushion chairs and um, and we have armrests and backrests and lumbar supports. And, and it, seems, it seems that as time goes on, there's less and less need for us to have intrinsic strength because we have a world that is supporting us extrinsically. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what you mentioned uh, at the outset about uh, modern footwear being the source of so many problems, but from a, a, a decreased sensory input standpoint, you could definitely make the argument that the same thing is happening with all these external supports. You know, you're, you're leaning up against something and essentially you shut everything down because you're being pushed back on. So um, it's, it's, it's curious. And, and I wonder if, so you've been in clinical practice for 10 years, that would be long enough to start to see some trends. Are you seeing younger patients at this point uh, with foot problems or, or do you have any uh, mentors or, or colleagues that have been in practice for extended periods of time that are commenting on seeing younger people that are now having foot problems where that never happened at the beginning of their career? Yeah, I would probably say where, where they may be seeing them younger would be the obesity like what you're saying, and uh, childhood diabetes, mm -hmm. which affects the feet. There's so much research and literature around diabetes and obesity and what it does to the feet, especially mm -hmm. just the, the connective tissue and the inflammation from those conditions. Uh, obesity is an inflammatory condition. So anyone who's overweight just has a high inflammation level and inflammation or acidity is very um, sticky to tissue. So I'll tell people that it just gets sticky. So then you don't have as good of circulation. Some of the blood viscosity that I was saying earlier, it, your blood gets sticky, your tissue gets sticky, everything just kind of sits in a sense that I have heard that from um, some of my colleagues as I was going through like residency training. So these are podiatrists that have been in the industry for, you know, decades. And some of that, I went to podiatry school and I practiced my first nine years of my career in New York City. And I lived in New York City for 20 years. So I saw a very specific population, um, not just a city that walks. So I see everyone that walks, but also some of the highest childhood obesity and diabetic rates are in the South Bronx. So we actually did a lot of work in some of these neighborhoods and we would go into the schools and screen these children's feet to then see if maybe there was a way to um, intervene. So I don't know if you remember like the scoliosis checks and like the vision checks, right? We were trying to make it be kind of standardized that children should be checked, their feet should be checked. Mm -hmm. And if you're starting to see something in a very young age, then like, let's say flat feet, overpronation, flat feet in a child that is overweight, and maybe the childhood obesity is putting them at risk for type two diabetes, and they're, let's say 10 years old or something like that. Um, what happens is that when we have a flat foot or an overpronated foot, it's a little bit more of an unstable, hypermobile, clumsy foot, like it's a slower foot, right? So a child that is developing motor coordination and motor patterns and just understanding dexterity and all of that stuff, right? They get discouraged if they are clumsy, if they're slower, if they're the last kid in physical ed, if they even have his <laughs> classes anymore, right? So it's actually something huge from a public health concern is you got to get the kids, screen the kids, the kids that do have maybe certain foot types or are at risk for foot influences systemically or whole body wise or movement wise to do something to intervene whether that's orthotics, I don't know, or barefoot play or foot strengthening, but I would argue that 
now in this generation that it's actually happening there and that's where you have to fix the problem uh can you go into that a little bit more what do you mean by that that it's happening in this uh it's happening there in this generation yeah so i think that a lot of the foot problems so the six to ten year olds six to twelve year olds that you're seeing right now in the schools that they're playing video games and they're a little bit overweight and they're not getting movement or the sensory stimulation and they're not getting the natural barefoot play outside like i played in the dirt my parents would just kick us outside and go play in the dirt right and that was actually strengthening our feet that was strengthening our nervous system our foot to core our glutes our single leg balance right all those things get strengthened if i don't have that i then become a teenager that has overpronation and then this is what i see they're 18 years old and they go to work their first job and they have such severe foot pain that they cannot stand and then they come to me and they're like i can't work because i can't stand because of my foot type or my foot pain right and i've seen that many times i've actually seen that in new york many many times and i knew that the issue was way 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 earlier in their life that they should have either been orthotics or strengthening their feet or more active or something well i love how you just approach that because so few people are are willing to say what you just said which is everybody wants to blame oh genetics oh i have a genetic my foot type doesn't allow me to stand all day long the human species cannot have evolved to the point where we can't stand up that's 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 just not the way that evolution works it's also taken place so quickly which is what you were saying a minute ago about it happening in this generation but to go back and say oh that's because you probably didn't have any barefoot play a, as a kid and you never developed the muscular strength that's necessary so the obvious follow up question to that is can this 18 year old increase strength with targeted strength training exercises like the kind that you teach um, and, and prescribe to a lot of your patients, no doubt, can they build that strength back up and get to where they need to be, where, where they can be a functional human being who can stand up during the day without having pain from it? Yeah, most of them, yes. And that's majority of my patients now would be that type of individual. Mm -hmm. um, now there's exceptions because maybe they have you know, a unique ligament laxity and, you know, a navicular drop and really they should be in orthotics, mm -hmm. right? And then that's their way. But still, even for that patient that has the ligament laxity midfoot collapse and should be in orthotics, should still be strengthening their foot over here with sensory stimulation. So my answer would be yes, because what they probably don't have in parallel is decreased core activation. Their, you know, erector spinae is probably either overactive or shut down, their glutes are shut down, right? So things that would be more kind of into your forte, but they're connected, right? And, and yes, it's then having that 18 year old take their health into their own hands. And that's why I think the internet is good because it does teach the younger generation. I've actually seen patients, um, teenagers, 16, 17, 18, under approval of their parents for them to see me, but they are actually curious at that age and say, I want to understand my body, how I'm moving. And I'm like, wow, I like props to you to be a 16 year old saying like, I want to fix my feet. I think it's awesome. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. What I love there though, is, is so many people nowadays want to blame, oh, my genetic, my genetics or, oh, my foot type. And you said a minute ago, the vast majority of people can improve even having not gone through those say developmental steps of having the, the right type of input at the at the right point in time you can still go back and increase your strength and become functional so what percent of people actually have a foot type or let's say flat feet because i looked at some of the numbers on this and and it's a very small percentage but maybe you know the the, the specific numbers and certainly you would know from your clinical practice of who has a genetic foot type where they're just like, oh, you know what? I overpronate because I have genetic flat foot that five generations back in my family, everybody had genetic flat foot. And, and then what percentage of people, what route do they go versus the route that just has to say, hey, 
my foot wasn't strong enough and now I'm going to make it strong enough. Yeah, if I can first start this by going into the three main types of flat feet. Yes, please. Okay, cool. And I, I'll be kind of quick on it. So <laughs> no, take your time. Yeah. I, wanna, I wanna know. Okay, cool. So I'm not a big fan of the term flat feet because it's very confusing, right? If a patient came in or they wrote on their intake form and said, I have flat feet, help me, right? I wouldn't know, right? What, what exactly? does that mean okay so the first type of a flat foot is what's called an uh, uh, flexible flat foot that is actually over pronated okay. and that is someone that when they sit in a chair with their feet extended they have this beautiful arch and then as soon as they stand up with gravity and their body weight their foot goes like this okay now i want the listeners if they see the video that i did not do this, I did this. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I did that, I rotated. So there was this spiraling inward that happens when your foot collapses. So it drops in, it doesn't drop down. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really, really important for patients to understand because then it helps them to understand how to correct that foot type. Mm -hmm. and just the mechanism so, so you're talking yeah. about then uh effect on the ankle effect on the knee effect on the hip effect on the pelvis so kinetic yes. chain just working our way up exactly okay. yes but it's it's flexible which means it has the potential to make an arch mm -hmm. you just don't have either the strength or the connective tissue integrity to keep the to keep the arch up okay so Spilling inward, it's spilling inward. Yeah. That's a flexible, flat foot, flexible over pronation. Okay. That's what it is, over pronation. Now, the second is a rigid flat foot or really a rigid over pronated foot. Okay. That is one that when they're sitting in a chair from across the room, you can see that that foot is flat. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's still rolling inward, but it's, it's flat. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a foot that is flat open chain or when you're not on the ground is going to be flat when you're on the ground, right? So it's not moving anywhere. Okay? That's fair. <laughs> yeah. That is a progression of a flexible flat foot or over pronated foot from years of stress and arthritis and the joints fused. So it's a progression of this flexible over pronated foot. Okay. okay? Understood. So that's the second one. Typically, you'll see that in an older patient. Okay. So you hit a certain age, that's kind of the over 50 that we were talking about, right? So it's an older patient that you typically see that. The third one, I call a pancake foot. Okay. And a pancake foot is straight down pancake. Mm -hmm. It's not spilling inward. There's no rolling inward. So it doesn't have the same effect on the knees, hips, and lower back. As the over pronation that's spiraling and spilling inwards. Interesting. Okay. okay. Now the pancake foot, why I differentiate this is because the pancake foot, which is just straight down, it's flat, that's more genetic. Okay. You can okay. throw that genetic around if you want. Okay. I see that in older populations, meaning the oldest people that were on this planet. <laughs> so I see it a lot in Asia. Yeah. And I see it a lot in African Interesting. descent, descent yeah. right? Um, and a lot of that has to do with just evolution and how the foot and the arch is shaped. Okay. So there's certain changes that you can see in different foot types and lineages from Africa, Asia into Europe, mm -hmm. and then how that came across to the United States. Um, and this is in anthropological studies. And I've also been blessed to travel to 40 countries and teach about feet. So I have seen thousands upon thousands of feet from <laughs> different countries. I and bet. I will see all of the exact same foot type when I am in Indonesia, when mm -hmm. I'm in China, when I'm in South Africa. And I, right. So, um, so that's part of it. Now, where it comes to the influence on function orthotics work the best classic orthotic would be in the flexible over pronated foot that is spilling inward when they stand up and bring gravity and body weight into the foot. Mm -hmm. A rigid over pronated foot does not tolerate orthotics. Mm -hmm. A pancake foot 
does not tolerate orthotics. So if any of the listeners are like, I went to a podiatrist and they told me I have flat feet and they gave me orthotics and they hurt, I couldn't use them. Yeah. It's that's where I see a lot of that is that it's uh, ill prescribed or improperly prescribed because there's this flat feet equals yes. this. And then yeah. you give an orthotic, a rigid orthotic to all yes. flat feet, and then they will be corrected. It doesn't work that way. That is a, a brilliant differentiation. I love that. I'm guessing you didn't get that in, in podiatry school. Um, not explained like that. Obviously, I, I learned about okay. those flat feet. Um, yeah, but, but not this, the three different kinds. No, no, no. And the pancake foot, a lot of that was me traveling over the last 10 years and seeing these things. And then again, being curious and mm -hmm. just like, huh, huh. Right. And I, I see a lot of high arches more in the European countries, mm -hmm. right? Obviously the U S you see a gamut of everything, sure. but when I would go to Asia, it literally everyone, almost everyone would have this pancake foot Interesting. and I would be explaining about foot types, yeah. right? And this is an inverted foot and a high arch. And I'd have to use myself as the example of the neutral or higher arch or inversion because they all had this pancake foot and a lot of it is genetic right or through the lineages and the way that the bones form i don't think that that has to do with barefoot stimulation or not yeah. um, i think it has to do much more like heavy into the connective tissue and the way that the bone shape um almost like I'm tall or I'm short. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? no, I, 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 find, I find that fascinating. So that the pancake foot, that person still has normal biomechanics at the ankle, the knee and the hip. They can still be in a neutral position there while the foot is flat is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the x-rays of someone with a pancake foot is what mm -hmm. I call it, you would actually see all of the bones sitting parallel. And normally yeah, yeah. there is, this is the heel bone. There's a calcaneal inclination, sorry for the listeners, There's, <laughs> and a metatarsal declination, like that's what gives the foot its shape. Yeah. You see the calcaneus is literally parallel to the ground mm -hmm. in a pancake foot. So we could say a flattening of the arch. Yeah, a flattening of the arch, but it's straight down in the sagittal plane versus in the transverse plane. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and then that has a different effect up the kinematic chain, right? And then it's also important, really these orthotics, I would get tons of patients that would just say, I've given orthotics, they don't work. And I hear that so many times that it, you have to kind of sit back and not say, well, therefore orthotics are bad, sure. but it's more like, what's the orthotic that's prescribed? What is the stiffness? Are they trying to drive the arch up? Are they trying to post it yeah. or wedge it in a certain way? If you try to do any of that to a rigid foot, yeah. it's not going to work. And then the patient is going to have extreme discomfort. Sure. So it was more me saying, what's going on with the way that these orthotics are being prescribed, yeah. match it to the foot type, and then just start to see trends and parallels on that. Yeah, well, that's a much more nuanced conversation. One of the things that I always say is, you know, I, I think of it like a carpenter's belt and I've got like 50 different screwdrivers and, and one of them isn't better than the other. It's just which one matches up with the screw that I'm trying to put in. Yeah. yeah. So I, that, I, I relate to that tremendously. I love what you said there about, first of all, the differences makes perfect sense that a person with a rigid flat foot wouldn't respond well to an orthotic because the joints have no play in them. So they can't take the input from the orthotic. It's just like hitting them with a hammer on every step that they take. Whereas that uh, floppy flat foot or the flexible flat foot, as, as you said it, they're going to respond beautifully. But I think a lot of it, I'm going to take a, a, a little bit of, of, of space on this one into your realm. And you tell me if I'm wrong, because I see this in my realm a lot, which is um, incomplete or poor instructions for how to use an orthotic or how to ease somebody into what I consider to be a process, not a light switch. Like here's your orthotic, boom, it's, uh, the world is now open and, and your oyster, you know, and nobody says, hey, you might want to try this for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes a day and ease your way into it because you are going to be changing not just your foot, but everything up to the top of your head and your body is going to change in response to your foot position changing. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I say the same thing. Um, and I will then also tie in blood vessels mm -hmm. and nerve tissue, like everything sits and adjusts. Right. So it's not a magic insert. I wish actually so many patients wish it was. <laughs> Yeah, well, the other thing that you get into there is is a philosophical issue, which is with that flexible flat foot, which uh, we can say in the below 60, below 50 age range would be the majority of those flat feet, if I'm understanding you correctly. Then where do you get into philosophically between uh, external support via an orthotic versus strengthening the intrinsic via training methods and, and and a different process, but uh, one could easily argue a more important process. I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope we go into this. <laughs> so yes. So the way that I'll break it down, and you can kind of think of it almost like a flow chart, is that first I'm differentiating, are they flexible or rigid, or are they this kind of outlier pancake foot, which is rigid anyway, so it's on the rigid side. Um, if they have the flexible flat foot or overpronation, then I further classify and I say, is this more of a matter of foot weakness mm -hmm. or do they have ligament laxity and a hypermobile foot? Because there's two different causes to that then, right? If they have, and then under that is then mild, moderate, severe, we'll just say. And there's a spectrum of that. Typically, a mild, flexible, overpronated foot is not ligament lax or hypermobile. They respond very well to strengthening the foot <laughs> and the core and the glutes. Sorry, cannot forget up higher. Absolutely. Yeah. And the core and the glutes. On then the moderate, it, it, it really is on which side. So let's say we have a moderate um, patient over pronation that's flexible, and they're on either side of that. I then go into what is their injury history and what are the demands that they're putting on their foot. If they're a runner and they have a history of plantar fasciitis when they run, as an example, then I may have them use an orthotic just when they run. And it'll be a very specific orthotic for running, not walking and running orthotics. Are, are actually different. The shell is to be different. And that's also really important for the patient and the, the user to understand. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, can you just explain what the shell is? Yes. So I, oh, I don't have an orthotic. Normally I have everything sitting on my chair. Um, the shell would be the back part of the orthotic. Okay. So this part. And it's the, the hard plastic. Okay piece with the arch built into it. Um, and that's actually the part of the orthotic that controls the foot mm -hmm. in a sense. Okay. Now all shells of orthotics have a certain stiffness to them. Not all orthotics are, they're not hard plastic, right? A lot are, and that's what the consumer or the patient, like the lay person thinks and associates with orthotics is a very hard plastic shell pushing into their foot. Okay. That's not the case. The prescriber has the ability to create flex. So I, I can dial in the flexibility of that shell or how high or low I want the arch of the shell. That's the, the art of orthotics is actually really complex mm -hmm. to, to really be good at them. So a running orthotic should be more flexible than a walking orthotic because of arch compression and how you load elastic energy when you run. So it's like the spring theory, right? Is that we're rubber bands and you have to load your rubber band by compressing your arch. That's running. Um, walking is different. So depending if you're on that moderate, let's say you don't do that. You're a mom of three and you just want to control your feet so that when you're with your kids and all that stuff, you don't have foot pain. Then I would probably say, let's just strengthen your feet, right? The load and the demands and the, the rate of force coming through your foot isn't as high as, you know, someone who is a runner. So let's just focus on foot strengthening and we're there. Over on the severe side, obviously they're going into orthotics, depending how aggressive, right? I can actually make quite aggressive orthotics that are uh, responded quite well to, so not in a negative way, but everyone is still doing strengthening and sensory stimulation of their feet. 
What I do want to add real quick is there is some research, because I know you love research. <laughs> there is research demonstrating that the average correction of six weeks of glute strengthening, this is just glute strengthening, on foot pronation is approximately two to three degrees, which is the average post or correction of an orthotic. Whoa. So, Whoa. Wait, yeah. how, how many weeks of glute strengthening? Six weeks. Six weeks of glute strengthening can equal the average orthotic that's created in terms of its effect on the arch of the, or the angle of the, the, the posterior arch of the foot. Yep. So if I'm going, if I'm going to, and you're like, I need that study. Uh, I love <laughs> it. Yes, for study. sure. I definitely yes. want. Yes. So if I'm going to do an orthotic that has an average mild correction, like a two to three degree post, and I'm sorry if the listeners don't understand, but just say like the, the average correction orthotic does, okay. if that's the case, I'm going to start with glute strengthening, foot strengthening, all of that. So maybe the patient doesn't need the orthotic. I love um, it. Or if they have an active plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, post tib tendonitis, any itis, mm -hmm. I will have them in the orthotic for a period okay. while we're strengthening everything. And then I'm going to pull them out of the orthotic. And nice. at that case, I don't even do custom. Okay. I just go over the counter. And the over the counter that I love outside of Naboso is, <laughs> is power steps, power steps, power steps is my go-to over the counter. Okay. Awesome. Um, just based off of patient response, how I see patients is really based off of patient's response. Mm -hmm. Um, and the amount of correction for this temporary transient period, don't spend $500. Yeah. Like, don't do that. Like I'll take your money, but don't, <laughs> don't spend $500, right? Just buy a $25 power step and it is good. It's sufficient. Do the strengthening. We're good to go. That's awesome. And then do you kind of wean them off of the orthotic at the end? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and now I'm starting to read your mind because I, I love where you're going with this stuff. That's, that's fantastic. So we got three different types of flat feet and then there's subcategories in that, but it's fair to say that the vast majority of those flat footed people, because the genetic classification is the smallest. And then we have the, the older population that's such severe wear and tear that they've fused up and, and, and we're limited in what we can get out of them functionally at that point. Right? right. But the vast majority, and can you just ballpark it? I'm not going to hold you to it, but just ballpark it in terms of what percentage of flat feet people are going to flat footed people are going to respond well to functional issues. Let's, let's, let's further specify the question and say flat footed people under the age of 65. I mean, a majority, a majority, like the number 80%. I mean, yeah, I would say maybe like 80%. If you're like, oh. you got to give me, you got to give me a percent. Then yeah, I'll, I'll say 80%. I know um, I'm pinning you down on it, but, but I just, I want to make sure that what I have in my head is, is somewhat accurate. And, and like we talked about, you know, there's just not a lot of epidemiological stuff um, yeah. when it comes to podiatry, which is great because you can create it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. One thing I do want to add though, is that for the listener is... And this is my like disclaimer under the bottom sure, yeah, yeah. that a lot of people will then listen to this podcast and read everything and follow me on Instagram and do everything that I say. And then they're not getting better. They're wearing the minimal shoes. They go everywhere barefoot. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they say like, I still have you know, plantar fasciitis over the last few years, or my ankle bothers me. And then I see their foot. Finally, they become a patient then finally, and they were over here mm -hmm. on the severe ligament lax over pronated. Sure. So I always encourage everyone to do a functional foot assessment. Actually, if you go to barefootstrong.com, I have one that you can just do on there and you can like take pictures and just kind of get a baseline of your foot to understand. That's fantastic. We'll uh, I, put a link to that in, okay, the, cool. uh, in the description. Perfect. Because I don't want the patient over here to have done everything like they're actually this foot type and then sure. they hurt themselves. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's the, the only like little disclaimer on the bottom. Doesn't mean that you can't, but 
a majority of my practice is is focused on getting people out of orthotics and getting them strengthening and naturally. And then the other part of my practice is getting people that thought they could do that <laughs> into, into this balanced environment, which is, it's the minority. Sure. It's a great minority of, of people that that is, yeah. but to understand that is really important um, just for their own safety. Sure. Well, that, that's a fantastic answer. And what you're talking about is the inherent limitation of what we can do online as clinicians. You know, we can talk about these generalities, but uh, it's always best if you have a functional assessment so you actually know what you're dealing with before making a recommendation. I 100% agree with you. Now, just to uh, re review, Dr. Splickle, the, uh, the three types of flat feet are associated with a number of different itises and conditions. Can you just uh, remind us of those? Uh, you said plantar fasciitis, posterior uh, tibialis tendonitis, these types of things. Yeah, so the, those would be the big ones. So post tip tendonitis, which is the tendon that wraps around the inside of the ankle and inserts on the arch. Mm -hmm. So it's the muscle that's primarily responsible for lifting the arch, mm -hmm. the post tib tendon, so you get an itis in that. Plantar fasciitis, obviously in the bottom of the foot, Achilles tendonitis in the back of the heel, so not the bottom, but the back of the heel. And then you can get more, I see it as a compensatory itis, is something with the perineals, so on the outside. Mm -hmm. Typically, I'll see chronic plantar fasciitis, and then they get a subsequent perineal tendonitis because they're trying to get off of the mm -hmm. heel and yeah. compensate. Yes. Um, I'd say some other big ones that you'll see are shin splints. Sure. For sure, the shin splints, and then um, going higher up into your into your area would be things with the knees, and then of course the lower back. Sure, and then and then just to kind of state the obvious, it becomes very difficult to resolve any type of those itises without addressing the flat foot. Correct. I need to get the foot and tissue into a quiescent space. So that's where I will recommend orthotics. Like I said earlier, sometimes patients or people are surprised when I say that, um, or I've actually done a handful of, of steroid injections. I think there's a time and place for a steroid injection or a cortisone injection for the listeners. Um, and the purpose is more to just calm the fire. I got to put the fire out before I can start to deal with other things. Um, and that might be orthotics, immobilization in like a boot. I would never do a boot for an extended period of time. That is the biggest no-no that I see within the medical space. Um, and then sometimes cortisone injections. Very interesting. Um, I want to talk uh, about another, another very common problem in modern society, which is bunions. Now, I did a brief video on bunions and, and I had some people who were very upset with me because I talked about how the big toe should be in line with the first metatarsal. These two things have a tendon that run down them that creates motion at the big toe. And if they're not in line with one another, it makes it very difficult for them to function properly. And I promptly had a number of keyboard experts pointing out to me that not everybody is born with a straight line, which I can get on board that not everyone is born with a straight line, but I still think that a normal foot should have normal structure. And we're making some generalities here, but if you could just talk a little bit about bunions uh, why they're so prevalent in modern society, why it tends to be heavily dominated by women and not men, um, and, uh, and, and just go into what you see in practice with, with those issues. Yeah, so one of the biggest associations with a bunion is the foot type, and that's going to be your uh, flexible overpronated foot. Okay. So the one that we were just speaking about, Perfect. flexible overpronated more on this side. So this is the severe, the more severe and the ligament lax or hypermobile that a foot is, it essentially unlocks. So the bone that is swinging over in the foot, the joint is kind of in the middle of the foot. And that's where the ligament laxity sits. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the first ray, if anyone is curious, right? So the metacuniform joint is, is hypermobile. Um, and if that joint has laxity or hypermobility to it, it essentially allows that bone to swing out. And then the toe is being pulled the other way by muscles inside the foot. And then that creates the bunion. So really the biggest driver of bunion formation is an unstable, unlocked hypermobile foot. 
over pronation. Um, and then bunions are progressive, which means that every step you take in a foot or a joint that is not aligned, you favor or you just reinforce the imbalance in the first place, which is where like if you use toe spacers, toe spacers realign the joint, how you were explaining it, and it can slow the progression of the bunion. So there's ways that you could slow it, right? But bunions by nature are progressive. Um, a lot of people will blame footwear. So shoes saying like, oh, it's narrow shoes and the shoe is angled and it pulls it in. My response to that, and I really should have a foot model. So I'm sorry, I just keep using my hand, but uh, how can I explain this? So a bunion is the bump on the side of the foot, not the angulation of the toe. Okay. I think is important. Okay. So the larger the bump where the bump is the metatarsal head of the bone that's swinging out. That's, it's just the head that's now prominent because the bone angled itself, mm -hmm. right? So that angulation and the head becoming prominent goes back to this joint that is hypermobile. Okay. That's the problem. That's the bunion right there. Mm -hmm. Narrow shoes or pointed shoes mm -hmm. don't do anything to this joint back here. All they do is push the big toe in. Mm -hmm. So if you look and say, oh, if I take off my shoes and my foot looks like the shape of the shoe, right? Like it is when it's in it and my toe is angled this way. That's not really a bunion. Mm -hmm. To I think the to general population or to social media, mm. <laughs> social media thinks that that's a bunion, but it's not really the bunion. Is it a angulation of the hallux relative to the first metatarsal? Sure, but the bunion is that deviation of the metatarsal. Mm -hmm. So I hope that that maybe helps to clarify a little bit. And that uh, helps just I I, I want to I want to follow up then and ask you a question. So so what you're saying is then then a person can have a medially deviated big toe or big toe that's turned towards the midline of the foot and not have a bunion? Mm -hmm. Okay. So and, you could have an angulation different. at that joint. Okay. Right. And then not have a increased intermetatarsal angle. So you, so what you're saying then is a bunion can only be diagnosed on x-ray? That's the only way that I diagnose them. Okay. Okay. So, so now that's making sense. And then and then my follow-up question to that would be, uh, there would have to be a certain amount of space that you're actually measuring to the point where this is the cutoff for a bunion. Yeah. So what is that, for, or what is that degree? Yeah, so um, up to like 12 degrees of an angle. And in podiatry and foot surgery, the larger the angle, you actually choose different procedures. So it's, it's actually how you would grade it. So you're grading it off of the intermetatarsal angle mm -hmm. between the first and the second metatarsal. Not just there are angles on x-ray as far as how the big toe is moving towards the lesser digits. You can measure that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get angulation in uh, this joint as well. Mm -hmm. This knuckle of the big toe, which can kind of skew the perception of a bunion, let's say where it's actually not at the first MPJ, it's at this joint that's angled over. But when you look at your foot as a patient, you see angulation and you can't differentiate it. Is it the IPJ or the MPJ? Interesting. A little bit more distal. Um, the ones at the IPJ is a little bit more with shoes. Mm -hmm. that it's putting pressure on it. Okay. Um, but when I see a patient with a bunion, and if, if this is confusing to your listeners, I'm so sorry of all the IM and, you know, MPJs and IPJs. I'm so sorry. Um, but we could just say the, the proximal joint or the distal. Yeah, the high yeah. Everybody will probably get that. Right. Okay, good. So the <laughs> distal. Um, yeah. But uh, the biggest takeaway for the listeners that might be like, ah, I think I have a bunion, but and I'm always been a little bit confused about the severity of my bunion. Mm -hmm. A thorough, thorough bunion evaluation really, in my opinion, deems it to be matched to x-rays. Okay. So if I see a patient for a bunion, whether I see that patient virtually or in person in my office, mm -hmm. I need to see x-rays. Okay. And if they don't have x-rays, 
or they refuse to get x-rays, whatever the issue may be, hmm. I will give them my recommendations, but say with a little disclaimer hmm. that I can't fully give you all of the information that I want because I don't know what your joint space is. I don't know, you know, what the centration of the cartilage is relative to each other, what that IM angle is. So it's also where when people say, oh, I fixed my bunion and they show it on social media, like before and after I fixed my bunion, I reversed my bunion. Mm -hmm. I, I would want to look at every single one of those on x-ray okay. because clinically and radiographically things, things look really different on x-ray versus just like this. For sure. um, and statically, this snapshot of a foot mm -hmm. is always different than when you're walking mm -hmm. as well. So I will video people and I can assess their bunion in the way that the bunion deviates open chain, weight bearing, and then walking. And they all are actually really different because as soon as you're walking, well, now I have muscles contracting mm -hmm. and the intrinsics are going to engage and the intrinsic pulls the hallux over even more mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the listeners, you should only evaluate your bunion weight bearing. Okay. You have to be standing on your feet versus just with your foot extended, actually be weight bearing, looking at your foot mm -hmm. with gravity and body weight to understand the true alignment. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with x-rays. I'll only look at bunion x-rays that are weight bearing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that's a common practice within chiropractic as well. We don't shoot non-weight bearing x-rays of the spine. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. So the same thing, right? If someone's laying on a table and had an x-ray of their spine, very different than gravity and how muscles pull and things like that. 100%, 100%. A, a non-weight bearing x-ray is of very little use to me in most cases. Yeah, the same as you. So yeah, I, so to, to, to go back there, the bunion refers to specifically the bump on the lateral edge of the, of the big toe. So just because a person has a medially deviated big toe, a big toe that's turning inward does not necessarily mean that they have a bunion. Although, would it be fair to say that that's a strong indicator? Yeah. And I mean, you still be like, well, what's the diagnosis? I got to call it something. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I, if I need to give you a diagnosis, I'm going to write a bunion. <laughs> yeah. okay. I got to give you a diagnosis, right? Yeah. So I'm using it. The reason, and this is also where it's very hard for people I hope no one takes anything I say and just takes one sentence and then totally makes a completely different context out of it. But um, where I want the clarity around bunions, because there is so much misconception, is that there's a big difference between a big toe that's deviated because it's soft tissue. It's actually still within the soft tissue. As soon as you start to get the bump, mm -hmm right? Then that is structural. It's within the joints. It's in the bones. So maybe you could say one's a soft tissue bunion, one is a bony bunion or a structural bunion. Okay. I mean, you could maybe add that word before it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's where I could say, okay, if I look at a toe that's just deviated to the side and maybe it's because of shoes and I tell them to wear toe spacers and they wear toe spacers every day for six months and they're like, look, Dr. Emily, it's straight. I, that I would expect mm -hmm. because that had nothing to do with that angle in the, the bones or the bump or the metatarsal head. Okay. Um, the metatarsal head, you can't get that to go away without surgery. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the most important thing that I will stand behind. And, you know, doesn't mean don't wear toe spacers and do your corrective exercise and all these things to strengthen your foot. And if you, it just becomes more aesthetic then, mm -hmm. right? And okay. you have to find maybe wider shoes and things like that. Um, I, I have a question then about the surgical correction of bunions because I, I know for a fact that I've seen surgeries. Now, maybe these were old surgeries where they're actually shaving down the bump on, on, on the, lateral, the lateral edge of the big toe. That does nothing to correct the alignment of the foot. <laughs> so um, why are they is just an aesthetic surgery at, the, at that point or or why are they doing that is is a, has always been my question I mean it's part of the reason why my uh impression of podiatry was like whoa I, I don't know that I agree with what they're doing over there so I'm glad that we're having that conversation also because that is um that is one where I will then protect the podiatry or stand behind podiatry Please. Is 
is so part of bunion surgery is that you do shave the bump. Okay. You don't shave the whole bump off. You shave, you know, like a few millimeters, okay. and then the shaving of the bump uh, opens or gives you access to a smooth site that you can cut. And then the other part of the procedure is supposed to be that you cut essentially. Um, it's a chevron, so like a triangle in a sense, and then you shift the head over and then you throw a screw. Mm -hmm. So what's aligned the joint is that you shifted the head over. Mm -hmm. That's the distal procedure. The procedure that I actually favor because I see primarily hypermobile feet, so more the extreme side, is that you would fuse the joint that is hypermobile. The joint way down here that is hypermobile, you fuse it. So you still shave the bum, a couple millimeters, and then you cut, you cut like a wedge out of the base and then you swing the whole bone over and then you fuse it. Nice. So if, if someone mm. did just a bumpectomy, mm. say, I'm just gonna shave the head so that you can fit in a little bit more narrow shoes or the cosmetic side of it. Mm -hmm majority of the time, because I've actually done those, is the patient, so the recovery of traditional bunion surgery is six to eight weeks. The one where you fuse the joint can go a little bit further. Sure. Let's say the patient says, okay, this is killing me. I need to do something. I work so much. I have just a window of recovery and I want to do this over Christmas break or the New Year's break period, right? So then I'll say, okay, to shave the bump, really all you have to heal is soft tissue. So that's a two week recovery mm -hmm. that you're, you know, in a little surgical shoe, the shave, it's just the skin and the sutures that you want to heal. And you say, this is not correcting your bunion, mm -hmm. but what I'm doing is trying to make you more comfortable mm -hmm. so that you don't have as much pain in your shoes because of the size of your met head that swung out. And are you fine with just that? Okay. Other big one, osteopenia. Okay. They have some sort of osteopenia, osteoporosis, or cysts where their head will look like Swiss cheese. Mm -hmm. And then you can't throw a screw. The best you can do is kind of shave some of it. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of that appropriateness of, of where this is. Nice. But truly, and I like that you had questioned that and said, well, why did they do that? Did they do that just to accommodate, accommodate? is essentially palliative. Yeah. I'm just trying to make you more comfortable. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that I'll do that is just purely palliative yeah. as long as the patient understands. And then it's very clear. Um, but it's also important for the, the listeners to know that there are palliative options yeah. because some people might be like, absolutely not. I do not want bunion surgery. I have all these people who had bad experiences, mm -hmm. but I'm in so much pain. Could we at least do this bumpectomy, mm -hmm. quick recovery makes you a little bit more comfortable is that our happy middle okay. and then we're all good well that's a, that's a very good answer that's a, a a nuanced answer and i i can appreciate that yeah um so for the vast majority i keep trying to pigeonhole you and and i i appreciate that you don't let me that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> um for the vast majority of people with the clinical signs of a bunion who maybe don't have an x-ray of their foot Will they still benefit from the type of strengthening exercises that you prescribe? Um, everyone always benefits from foot strengthening, toe spacers, releasing their feet, sensory stimulation. Beautiful. Now, the, the goal is, can you push pause on the bunion? That's the way that I look at bunions. Can we just pause it, mm -hmm. right? And then you move on with a healthy foot regimen and lifestyle. So to clarify what you mean by that, and, and I understood it perfectly, is can we stop it from progressing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very well said. Beautiful. So what I want to get from you is a link for your foot assessment that we can provide to all the listeners. And I would love to hear closing thoughts from Dr. Emily Splickle. Where can everybody find you? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the foot typing, how you can take pictures and determine your foot type and then what to do is barefootstrong.com. Um, that's actually the name of my book, which is called Barefoot Strong. And it's all about um, anti-aging secrets for movement longevity. 
it's on Amazon. So if people want to check that out, um, my podiatry practice is my name. So dremilysplickle.com. If you don't know how to spell it, maybe you'll be linking that. I definitely <laughs> and then uh, Nobosa, which are the textured insoles and the mats and all of our products for optimizing sensory stimulation of the feet. That is Nobosa.com, N-A-B-O-S-O.com. And a fun fact is that Nobosa means barefoot in Czech. So that's a fun fact. Very interesting. <laughs> well, I'm going to put links for your book, for your practice, for Naboso, and for the foot screen from Barefoot Strong. Thank you so much for your time. It has been fascinating and very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that you'll put the information to good use. If you want to know more about Naboso or Dr. Emily Splickle and the awesome work that she's doing, check the links in the description down below. Beyond that, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel to stay updated on the new videos that come out each week, and drop any questions or comments that you have in the comments section down below. I check those every week. That's all for now. See you next time.